Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're listening to this, and welcome everyone. Today, I want to introduce you to someone I have admired for many, many years, and that is Dr. Peter Weinstein. Now, Peter is a veterinarian. He graduated from Cornell and received his DVM there at the university uh, after attending the University of Illinois. Uh, He also has an MBA, and you may be familiar with him as he has uh, the co-author of the E-Myth Veterinarian. Uh, a great business book that every veterinary practice owner should take to bed and and sleep with with under their pillow every night. Um, He has served as the president of the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association, um, past president for Vet Partners. He has just recently made a little bend in the road and, and resigned his position as the executive director for the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association and taken a faculty position at Western University. Um, He is a speaker, a writer. He speaks on leadership, team management. Um, We have had multiple discussions about some of our considerations of pain in veterinary school, even though I never attended. I I still see some pain there. Peter, welcome, and thank you for taking your time to come and talk to us a little bit about some of the curveballs that life throws us all. Debbie, thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, look forward to our conversation and and helping others uh, deal with the forks and and the twists and the turns in the roads. Yeah, I taught some uh, pre-vet students one day, I was at NC State, and I said, look, if you think that a career path is a straight arrow, I said, it is more like a drunkard's path. (laughs) You just get used to the fact that you pick up something everywhere along the the line that's a benefit to you. And don't think it has to be this perfect straight line because it's not going to be. There's always going to be a bend. So, Peter, tell us about, you know, kind of your origin story. You know, were you one of those kids who always wanted to be a veterinarian? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's see. My mom was a biology teacher. My uh, grandfather was the classic MD general practitioner, the Marcus Welby of the 60s and 50s, 60s, 70s. He lived upstairs and his medical office was downstairs. Um, So I had the the science background um, and I had some cats growing up. And so between uh, having cats, having the medical background and going to the veterinarian with my parents when we brought the cats in, I took a greater interest in in becoming a veterinarian than a a medical doctor. Uh, I never considered becoming a medical doctor. You know, when your grandfather comes to the house and you're running high behind the couch because you're not sure if he's coming as your grandfather or your doctor. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there was many times I was hiding because I wasn't sure which which grandfather I was getting that day. And then my dad was the CPA and that just seemed really boring. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I was one of these James Harriet influenced grow up and become a veterinarian, probably from the time I was 11 or so. So it's apparent that you followed that path and went to Cornell and became a veterinarian. Then you owned a practice. You practiced for three years, I think I remember. And then you bought a practice or just started a practice from scratch. Yeah. I wish it were that straight a curve, straight a line, but my undergraduate at Cornell was a great learning experience on how to um, party. Uh, (laughs) And uh, I would suggest that being a member of fraternity probably was, uh, had more twists and turns in the road. You were talking about the the drunken path. Um, Yeah, there was probably a little bit of that. So 
I was also one of the individuals who didn't get into veterinary school his first go round or his second go round. Living in, in New York, Cornell was really the only choice I had uh, at that point in time. There are only 18 veterinary schools. So I relocated to Illinois, became a resident of Illinois, and ended up going to veterinary school at the University of Illinois. But it took me a number of applications to get in. So I think one of the messages that I always have is perseverance, commitment, dedication. You know, don't let people saying, telling you no, get in your way, you know, surround yourself with, with positive people so that you figure that, that somebody will be there supporting you. So who you surround yourself with, like my parents were extremely supportive throughout the challenges. I, I don't think they knew what I was doing on the weekends in Ithaca, um, <laughs> what they were paying for. So yes, I eventually went to veterinary school, went to University of Illinois, uh, worked for a number of years, but I moved from central Illinois to Southern California, 2000 miles, no family, no friends, really didn't know anybody for my first job. My wife at that time and I, she was, she was an accountant. <laughs> so I married my father. No, I didn't marry my father, but uh, my first job sucked. I mean, I, there is just no way to put it. And uh, like many individuals, I thought I was kind of locked into that job because you read your contract and it says, hey, you're stuck met with an attorney who started laughing at me um, for not having read my contract. Lesson number two, read your contract. Read your contract. Well, uh, lesson number one, have a contract. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, have a contract. Yeah. Yeah, and, and lesson number two is read your contract. And lesson number three is know what laws are in, enforceable in the state of California and which laws aren't. <laughs> Anyhow, bottom line is I quit my first job without having a backup plan three months into it. Wow, wow. But, you know, talk about Ben's. First of all, I couldn't get into vet school. And then I quit my first job without a plan because it was so bad. So, Peter, I mean, obviously, that's going to be pretty scary. Tell me, I mean, it was it was that bad that it was it overcame the fear or it just how did you make that decision to go? Oh, I'm done. Well, I had two choices. I could really hate veterinary medicine and, and leave it and do something else. Sell drugs, the legal kind. <laughs> <laughs> or um, recalibrate, redirect. It was recommended that I speak to a number of colleagues in the community. And so I spoke to some other veterinarians and um, they helped me find other jobs within a week. I mean, I really was not unemployed for very long. And uh, the next number of jobs were all wonderful. I have nothing but great things to say about my colleagues who uh, I worked for in my second and third jobs. They're all still very good friends, mentors, uh, and that's going back 35 years. So you know, um, I, there's, I want to explore a little bit of this, Peter, because one of the things, and actually one of the reasons I started this podcast, podcast, is looking at so many people who were so miserable in their job, but yet they wouldn't take the leap to get out of that job. And I, I'm sure that there's a comfort in, uh, you know, habit, for one thing, we know that. And the other one is there's the great fear of the unknown. Am I going to get out into something that's even worse than I'm already in? But you, you had already made a dramatic change. Do you think that, you know, just having moved so far, having not been, I don't want to say indoctrinated, but, but just become so acclimated to this practice and where you were, that it made it easier to get out. So like if you had been there for five years and, and hated it the whole five years, would it have been more difficult for you to leave um, rather than just saying, oh gosh, you know what? I've just made a mistake. I've just gotten into this and now I need to go. You know, I, I think um, there's acute pain and chronic pain, mm -hmm. but we really need to learn how to address pain. And um, I think what you're talking about in my first job was acute pain and the pebble was, excuse me, the boulder was dropped on my foot and I could remove it and my foot would heal versus those of us who or others who have dealt with chronic pain where you're walking around with the pebble in your shoe, constantly limping, but you're dealing with it and the pain becomes, uh, it sucks the life out of you in many ways. So I think 
the acute pain made it easier to recover. And, and I think we can, we can see this in our patients as well. Mm -hmm. Acute pain seems to be easier to recover from than chronic pain. And so, yes, I, I think in many ways, leaving uh, in, in a short window allowed me to recover quicker and be more inclined to change than uh, if I had let it fester like a cat bite abscess and then all of a sudden it popped and there was pus all over the pillars. Right. So I, I wanted to treat the abscess early because I just couldn't believe that this was the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and looking back on that, because we're coming up onto a time where a lot of the new graduates are going to come out, you know, it's, they started looking, it's January, it's, that's when they start to look, and in May they take their jobs. Looking back on that, what do you wish you had looked for and ask, rather than just accepting this job and then taking off, you know, 2,000 miles? I wish they were a blacklist. Um. <laughs> Yeah, we've talked about that too. <laughs> now, I, I think um, they did a really good job. I mean, the practice was a gorgeous facility. The associates who I spoke to, uh, who I still am friends with, sold me a great bill of goods. And, and it was, a I had multiple choices and it was just the, the location and the opportunity looked great on the outside. I do think that you need to kick tires you need to look in closets. You need to talk to staff. I think if you can do two working interviews instead of just one, mm -hmm. people can only be on their best behavior for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I had called former employees, if I knew them, I met some of them afterwards that had been through the same thing that I could have learned. I, I really do think that currently for the, the classes, the current classes, do your due diligence. I mean, right now, uh, it, it's a perfect world for you because there's so many job opportunities mm -hmm. that you can take the time to make sure that there's a good fit. The marketplace 35 years ago wasn't bad, but as a new graduate, you're a lot more hesitant and a lot more reticent to be disruptive. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now is a good time to be disruptive. They need you more than you need them. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And you know, one of the points that you make was talk to the staff. And I think one of the things that I tell new graduates is talk to the staff. And one of the questions is, how long have you worked here? Because yeah. if, if nobody has worked there more than six months, that should be a red flag to you that, that there's a problem somewhere um, in, in Denmark, right? And they really need to, to find out what that is. And, and I think a lot of times there's equipment. There's, like you said, the beautiful facility and we're over um whelmed with this the, this how it looks on the surface and of course people do tend to make emotional decisions not based on logic and then they get into that and go oh you know we didn't really pay attention to you know the, the expired drugs on the shelf we didn't really pay attention to the fact that my doctor is throwing instruments at his technicians we've we forgot to look at that because we're we're so busy selling ourselves to the practice that we don't understand this practice has got to sell itself to us too. Um, it fit is a two-way street. And you know what that practice might have been fine for some people. And those those associates that were there might have been flourishing there. I don't know. But uh, not everybody's a good fit. I, I gave a talk one day and I said I used to hire people. And when I discovered that they were a mistake, I would let them go after two weeks. And people said, what about the 90 days? I said, who the hell made up the 90 days? I said, in two weeks, if it's not a good fit, why would you invest more time and effort in a person that is not going to be a good fit? You made a mistake. And then they have opportunities too, because if you wait 90 days, all those potential jobs they had are now gone and they've got to start all over again too. So that's unfair to them. Just cut the, cut the cord, let them go. And everybody starts over again without a great deal of investment or time loss. But you know, Cal I'm not going to say that in California because California changes the rules. About everything. We don't talk labor law in California. Um, so, so Peter, you know, there was obviously a decision making process in how you move forward. Um, now, tell me, you you went to work and and shortly, I mean, just like a week later, you were going to work for other people. But then, um, what made you decide to, to take that leap and open a practice? I think I had what I what Michael Gerber calls an entrepreneurial seizure. I was working for practice I was very happy with. The staff was great. The doctors were great. The quality of medicine was great. 
Uh, I was even learning how to do some management from the manager at the hospital. Uh, I was very involved. And then I saw some opportunities. I, we were actually, my, my boss and I were heading to a, a local uh, association meeting and we drove by a shopping center that was just being built. There was some open suites in the shopping center. Uh, there were 50,000 new homes being built in the hills around the community. And so I said, you know, I really want to start my own place and, and uh, see if I can be as successful as you are. And he was very supportive of that concept. What I didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I went ahead and signed a lease and started doing a build out. It was a, 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 a startup, not a, a purchase of an existing practice. And like many others who have had that entrepreneurial seizure, it's not until you're deeply embedded do you realize what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm working with two new um, entrepreneurial seizures at this point. But the cool thing is that they have engaged me for um, a year and a year and a half before they ever plan to open the doors. We are going through the leasing process and you know, setting up job descriptions and marketing plans and all that. And I went, this is wonderful because usually I get invited in after it's a mess. <laughs> and I'm sure you yeah. the same way. So, so I think maybe young veterinarians are really, instead of boomer generation, who we're very self-sufficient, we can do it all, right? Um, I think the younger veterinarians have said, you know what, we know how to find expertise and we're going to engage that expertise because in the long run, it's going to save us a whole lot of time, effort and money. Um, so I'm pretty excited about the fact that that's a, a, maybe a mindset change. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, 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 I find a lot of veterinarians, and, and you can tell me if you see this in your practice too, who started their own business because they hated where they were working and they wanted to do it their way. They wanted to do it better. You know, I'm not, I'm not never going to do it like this if, it's, if I own my own practice. And then they get in and they find out, well, there was a reason that those things were being done uh, and they're going to fall into that same pattern uh, because there's, you know, there, some things are necessities, right? They are necessities. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you decided to go back and get an MBA because you were, you were, I mean, Lord, <laughs> how did you have time to do it would be the question, of, the first question I would ask. What happened was that about three years into ownership, I was burned out. I was ready to sell, actually was looking to sell. The uh, business was okay. We had grown pretty quickly. There was a recession going on. And I also realized how little I knew about running a business from an accounting standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from a human resource standpoint, you know, what to say, what not to say. And there just seemed to be very little that the elective I took at Illinois gave me in terms of running a business. So even though I had a gene pool of a dad who was a CPA MBA, a wife then who was a CPA, it didn't help me on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought what, you know, you got to learn what needs to happen and it might as well not be from the school of hard knocks. So I went back to school and, and University of Redlands has what would be called a commuter campus or a, re, or re, a regional campus that was uh, 10 minutes from my house. And so I was working six days a week and I would take Thursday afternoons off because classes were Thursday night from six to 10. And so I would be in class Thursday night from six to 10. I would spend the weekends doing the assignments, many of which were written based upon the practice studying for tests. It meant a little bit fewer football games and a little bit less time at the pool. But after two and a half years, I completed the MBA and just it was an epiphany because instead of looking at veterinary medicine as the only source for information from a business standpoint, I learned to look at other businesses, Harley Davidson and, and um, Starbucks, which was just kind of getting started. And um, all sorts of different business models that were successful and, and, and unsuccessful and implemented ideas that came from other industries, not just veterinary medicine, but the more important thing is it, it showed me which books to read that were not strictly 
the veterinary books where we follow what the other leaders were, but we follow leaders from outside of the profession that gave us, give us a, a much more global overview. Yeah, I, I do think we have a tendency to be um, a little isolated in our bubble in veterinary medicine. And I grew up in the restaurant business. So I was used to hospitality industry benchmarks and service, you know, um, uh, objectives. And so that's how I ran the veterinary hospital, just because that's all I knew. And I did, I was very fortunate in my first practice to have gotten, uh, involved in a practice that was a good business practice. And Owen McCafferty had come in and kind of laid the groundwork. So I just took what I knew and what Owen had put in there. And my practice owner was a very astute businessman too. And so I was very blessed to grow up in, in a practice that ran well and was profitable and, and did things the, you know medically the right way. We were AHA accredited for 25 years. But I realized that there's... Um, a statistic, even from, you know, not just in, in our profession, which it actually may be worse in our profession, but universally, 51% of managers just get promoted with no training, and they only follow a path of whoever managed them who also had no training. So the reason I think a lot of our compassion fatigue, burnout, stress, turnover is happening is because our managers, our leaders are not getting the training they need to make the business work well for the entire team. I mean, it might work well for the clients and the patients, but but it's burning the team out. It's frying your doctors. It's an unsustainable lifestyle. The other thing is part of it too. So you you got your MBA, but you still sold your practice, right? Well, yeah, because I was able to build it, expand it, move it, expand it, and make it successful to a point that it had some value. And back then, 20 some odd years ago, when somebody came and wanted to write you a big check, and I was ready because I, I had a bigger fish to fry, I had a greater vision than to just be in a practice. Uh, the timing was right. So the, the retrospectively, if I had held on to the practice for the last 20 years with the multiples we're seeing right now, oh gosh, um, <laughs> you know, it'd be a whole different discussion. Yeah. But back then, I wanted to have a greater influence. And, and I think part of my MBA was that, was to mm -hmm. see about having a greater influence for the profession. I, I wrote a, an article once about how being a veterinarian is like being Dilbert, but the cubicle is the practice mm -hmm. because you really have very little influence except in your cubicle or your practice. And I wanted to have a voice. And I had started to get involved with organized veterinary medicine locally and I wanted to have a voice. And so I sold my practice probably younger than most, but I had a plan in mind. And that was just another of the multiple re multitude of recalibrations that I've gone through, but I had a plan. I had a direction. I knew what I wanted. Yeah, it wasn't straight, still isn't straight, but it's, uh, it was just because I couldn't I couldn't do everything I wanted to and still run the hospital. Um, so time for another change. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Peter, do you think, I mean, obviously you're a goal setter, um, having personal values that matter to you, that per that purpose, the big capital P purpose out there. Um, I, I find that a lot of people don't, take the time to examine their personal purpose and their personal core values. And like you, I, I wanted to help more people than just what I could manage. And, you know, I was managing three hospitals and a hundred employees, but when you get out and you start to teach and train, then you have greater influence on, on all the profession rather than just this one. But I keep my core values like right in front of me all the time. And when people do offer things that you know are I could do I have to see are they in alignment and I think that part of that decision making process is with the alignment let's talk a little bit about you know that that capital purpose for you and the decision making process and how that helps you make these decisions I mean the alignment of those things yeah the why mm -hmm. I mean I, I right to my right, you pointed at the wall like you have your vision or your values in front of you. My my personal vision is just off to my right here. And it's um, it's all about improving the profession 
for the future and teaching and educating not just not just the veterinarians but the veterinary students and future veterinary students and the public about everything that's great about veterinary medicine because mm -hmm. i think we as a profession have been lax in self promotion mm -hmm. uh, i think having that that vision and mission and values is something that dif differentiates everything that I do, as, as, as you noted, to help me make decisions. Sometimes I make financially based decisions that, that maybe are on the edges of my values, and then I want to slap myself. Um, but for the most part, if I feel that the focus is going to make a positive impact on the profession, I'm all over it, mm -hmm. sometimes to the detriment of time but always to the benefit of the profession. And I would say that, and Debbie, you know this from the hospitals that you've worked with, that, that most practices that actually do have a vision, mission, and values have a direction and they will steer their ship in that correct direction. But way too many practices do not have a vision, do not have a purpose, do not have any core values, and they're living Groundhog's Day every day and that's where the frustration, the burnout all comes from as well. I think that's a great way to put it, the Groundhog's Day. And, and if you think about it, and of course, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I try to teach practice owners this. If you have no core values, you can't hire people because the core values, they have to be in alignment. They have to believe the same thing that you believe. And they have to help you reach your goal and they have to want to help you reach your goal because it's part of who they are. And if you hire somebody who's misaligned with you, they're always going to be the squeaky wheel. They're always going to be the one who causes discord because their personal core values are not in alignment with what you want for the practice. And so asking the right questions on interviews, listening to storytelling, um, huge and storytelling is part of how you train your team to be, you know, to be aligned with the mission of the hospital. Um, I know, and you've seen this too, I look at core, I mean, at mission statements. There's mission statements all over the hospital websites for veterinarians. And you look at these things and honest to God, you could about take one from one website and stick it onto the other website. It means nothing to them emotionally. And, and veterinarians tend to not be, you know, very, um, let's say, um, emotional driven writers <laughs> and they won't pay anybody to write for them. You know, they, they feel it, but they, it's hard to get those feelings out for them. So, you know, one of the things I really work with my clients on is we've got to, why, why are you here? Why do you walk in the door? What gives you joy? And then let's talk about how that becomes the North Star of your hospital. But you got to put a little emotion into it so that the people who work there care about it. You know, uh, we give good service. We practice great medicine, we, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, but that's a hard thing. That's sometimes it's, it's the hardest thing I get a client to work on is the core, the base, the foundation of the house, because they want to build a house on top of sand, right? It's on top of sand. But in talking about these, you, you just made a mention of something. Every time I choose something, you know, financially that's outside of my purpose, I don't like it. I'm not happy about it. So what's the, what's the worst career mistake you ever made? The worst career mistake I ever made. I, you know, I, I don't think any career mistake was a mistake. I think they were all learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I worked for Nationwide for two years. I probably would still be working for Nationwide if there weren't some internal issues that were going on at the time that I was there. It was veterinary pet insurance when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I spent two years doing uh, both consulting and um, executive search, headhunting, whatever you want to call it, recruiting. That was about the most difficult couple of years because trying to guarantee people in an environment where the job market was really a little bit different but I learned from it. And so I would say that even leaving my first job after three months, if there was no negatives to it, they were all learning opportunities. So I, I would say that if you look at the changes that you make and learn from them, 
and don't make the same mistakes again and help others to avoid making the same mistakes, then you didn't make a mistake. Yeah, I, and I think that's true. I, I, you know, there's always something to learn. And even in every job I've ever had, there was something that I took away from it, whether it was, you know, working in the restaurants, waiting on tables. I managed a fabric shop for a while. Um, but even in managing the fabric shop, it's where I learned marketing because I had to set up ads for the, the fabrics in the shopping center. So there's always something that you can take away and learn from those things if you if you're a lifelong learner, um, some people never learn anything, right? Uh, always shocked to find out how many people never read a book after they graduate from school. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a book junkie. And if I didn't have my black background up here, you would see bookshelves and bookshelves and two nooks. And, you know, I, obviously that's, I think one of the keys to uh, career success is you've got to constantly learn and take up uh, that knowledge, you know, out there into the world. I, you know, Debbie, I did think of one career mistake. Yeah. Uh, the summer of my, between sophomore and junior years at undergrad, I was working in a small animal clinic. I was volunteering and working at a racetrack. And I decided to also sell cutlery door to door. <laughs> that was a mistake. I recognize that the introvert that you don't know um, <laughs> the introvert <laughs> trying to sell knives is just not going to work. So eventually, I think I got my parents and my aunt to buy knife sets, and that was enough to meet the target. And uh, that was the end of my life in sales from a cutlery standpoint. I didn't realize that when I got into veterinary medicine, and my colleagues don't want to hear this, that we were actually in sales every day as well. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, somebody said, uh, asked me one day, can you teach, can you create a, a webinar so that our sales reps can come in and train CSRs? And I said, no, you have absolutely no credibility. But what I will do is create a webinar where you can go in and teach them how to be salespeople. But we can't tell them that we're teaching them that. We're going to teach them sales skills because that's what we have to have. And in order to be successful as a veterinary team, you've got to be convincing to your clients that, that you're satisfying a need that they have. And you've got to be good enough at, at listening to find out what their goal is for walking in the door. It's not your goal. It is their goal. And we're not taught those things. You know, we're not taught those things. I was, uh, my husband has been in sales his entire life. And his two mantras are, it's easier to ask for it than, than work for it. <laughs> so we ask the question first and ask lots of questions. You know, it's ask lots of questions and spend time listening. And then, you know, because he was in the flooring business and he said, you wouldn't believe the, the number of people I've told I have this hideously ugly carpet that's in my house, but this, they want that confirmation. Yes, this is what I do for my dog if it was mine. Exactly. Yeah. So, Peter, um, you work for a um, uh, pet insurance company, and, you know, to some veterinarians, they look at that as like nirvana to go and work for industry. Even then, you said, you know, there, it's not perfect either. So, um, you made more changes. How did you end up as the executive director of the association? I was on the search committee. <laughs> and you found yourself <laughs> I, I was on the search committee I, I was part of the group looking for the trying to hire the executive director for the SCVMA now I'd been a past president uh, probably 15 years prior and I knew what the the job expectations were so I was on the search committee and we went through the process they had an open call it was listed on monster or something like that when we got through to the top three or four candidates the, the association needed, needed somebody who could step in now because there wasn't going to be an executive director there to train them. And the president, you know, the president didn't, didn't really know what went on behind the scenes from an association standpoint. And the administrative staff was good, but they really didn't have the ability to, to define what an executive director's role was. When we got down to the final few candidates and, and realize, I realized that this was not going to be a quick fix, it happened to be 2007, right before 
or right as the economy was um, tanking, and I was doing consulting. And business was okay, but not great, you may remember. And so I said, you know what? I don't think you can pay me what I want, but I'll be willing to consider the position if I can do some other things such as speaking and writing and et cetera. So um, I then put my, took myself off the um, interview panel and put myself on the other side, filled out the application and went through the final process to, uh, to be considered. And it, it was an interesting process to go through when you've gone from one side to the other side and like, like that, and all of a sudden you're, you're looking at it differently. And so they gave me the role. We did some negotiations. I stepped into the role approximately 14 years ago this month with no experience running an association but lots of experience running a small business and lots of organized medicine knowledge. And I put the two together. And there you were for 14 years. Right. So, but you just made another change after that time. And so the decision to, to change after all that time, um, what made you, and, you know, and, and here we are again, right. Going back out into consulting and then uh, faculty work. Um, now, had you done any any teaching in the past other than just, you know, the conference trainings and things like that? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have two kids. I figured uh -huh. that was teaching. Uh -huh. um, no, I had not ever been on a university faculty. I've done individual courses for different universities, uh, done a lot of EBMA talks. I didn't have a clue how much work it was it is to do to be a faculty member at a university. So to all of my colleagues out there and anybody who has graduated from anything beyond high school, it's a heck of a lot of work to be a professor or a faculty member at a university. The expectations are huge and the bureaucracy is even bigger. I uh, and, and the pay isn't all it's cracked up to be. I'm not complaining because it's been a lot of fun and I think I'll have some long-term influence, but it's a give your faculty members who you hated back in vet school a little bit of credit because I have a lot more respect for them now than I did back then. It's always different to be on the other side of things, right? I, uh, I've been doing some work with North Carolina State and our, the goal, uh, I didn't think I might've mentioned this to you before, is to have an undergraduate, um, either a certificate or um, a degree in veterinary practice management. And we do it in undergrad with electives because we can and it doesn't cost any more money. And there's already too much in the veterinary curriculum. But we've been working on this for five years. And as you go through it, you think, oh, I've got it. And, and we've got the courses and we've got the teachers. And then the department head quits, you know? And then there's, so the bureaucracy is what really is, it, it's kind of wearing on me because as somebody who's a manager, you know, our job is to solve problems, get it done and move on. And, and this is just like pushing a rope, man, to get it done. So I understand that the wheels grind slowly and there is so much ridiculousness in the academic process <laughs> for a lot of stuff when you're just this, you know, practical minded manager who's looking at going, what's wrong with you people? Can't you just do it, right? Just do it. But you can't. You cannot. There's too many rules. Um, so in teaching this class, Monica Dixon Perry, who is a, a CVPM like me with 20 years of experience managing hospitals, uh, me, another CVPM, 25 years of experience managing hospitals, we do not qualify as faculty members to teach this course that I've decided needed to happen because we don't have advanced degrees. We don't have MBAs. And um, so we have to find a faculty member, which we did. Dr. Amy Snyder is, is doing that for us, um, who is a DVM with an MBA to kind of be the part, you know, the, the leader for us. But oh my gosh, such craziness. Uh, and I understand that people just can't come in off the street, but let's have some practicality to this, but apparently not. <laughs> there's, it, there's, it's not there. So Peter, I'm, I'm excited that you're there because I know you and I know that you will make changes and disruptions whenever possible to make things better. So hallelujah. 
We need more people like you. And I think it's really important that people who have actually worked in practices, because uh, there's, I think there needs to be a reality check, you know, too many zebras, not enough horses, um, with these students coming out. And um, yeah. So let's talk about um, networking, because we both have an extensive network of, of people that we can call on. And I certainly plan on calling on you this coming year as the incoming president of Vet Partners. I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> but Sorry, the number you've reached is no longer in service. Oh, Peter, I know how to find you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So um, let's talk about networking and because do you find that that to be valuable? Do you, I know I've had some of my guests go, oh, I just, I hate the thought of networking, but it's really not this car salesman glad handing. I think that people most have in their mind, it's not what it is. So uh, talk about networking in, in your mind. Uh, there's a quote and I'm not sure to whom to attribute it, but it says your net worth is based upon your network. I would suggest that one of the things that I've brought to every organization that I've worked with is a network. I did that when I was in practice by becoming friends with industry people who are coming in, sales reps who I'm still friends with mm -hmm. and manufacturers reps and everything else. And then through my MBA, uh, became friends with people from outside of the industry and from the leadership roles that I've had through AVMA and, and CVMA. So everybody you meet is potentially somebody who needs you or somebody you will need or just somebody you can shoot the shit with. Sorry, you can edit that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think what you know my my dad had a rolodex on his desk we don't need a rolodex any longer we got smartphones amen but uh it's how big your rolodex is that ultimately determines how successful and influential you can be and it's really been interesting in the couple of months since i've left scvma and for a couple of months prior when i was trying to introduce my replacement to as many people as I possibly could, because she didn't bring the same network, but just to give her the good housekeeping seal of approval from myself to them goes a long way as well. So bottom line is to all of my colleagues, all the students at any level who might listen to this, don't call it a network, call it your fave five, whatever you wanna call it, but everybody you meet is a potential friend except if they're sitting next to you on an airplane, because then all they want is free veterinary advice. <laughs> Don't tell them what you do for a living. That's right. I've learned. I, I sold insurance on airplanes. Oh, <laughs> uh, I've worked for the IRS. Yeah, that'll Good stop it too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, you're two hours looking at dog pictures in somebody's phone as they scroll through. You're like, what have I done? Why did I say this? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I agree with you. I mean, you talked about in 2007 and 2008 and having a consultancy. Well, in 2008 is when I started my consultancy. And my network was so invaluable because I just picked up the phone and said to all my sales reps who I had known for 20 years, hey, I I'm thinking of doing this, you know, and they're like, great. You know, we know what you can do. We're going to put you to work. And I never looked back. And so, you know, I, I know that there are managers out there who don't talk to sales reps and there's practice owners who don't talk to sales reps. And all I keep saying is you've made a huge mistake. These people go into 100 hospitals and you go into one. You need to be asking these people, what are other people doing that I can do better? What are you seeing out there in the world? What's successful? What should I buy? What doesn't work? Uh, because when you build that relationship with people, people want to help you. Um, and then they will, you know, they absolutely will, provided that you don't go into it about yourself. You know, I think that's one of the things that you talked about sharing your network with the new ED. You didn't do that for yourself. You're doing that because it's for the good of the association and it will help her and it will help those that network too. I mean, it's a, a sharing thing. It's kind of like being a matchmaker and all the all the matches work out well. You know, they've become successful marriages. 
Uh, speaking of partnerships, I do have to ask you, how did you end up co-writing the e-myth? It's a good story. Um, so it was February a number of years ago, six years ago, I believe, maybe seven. And I was in um, Seattle, Tacoma area for the Pac-12 swimming championships. My daughter was a college swimmer at USC. And um, I got a phone call from a phone number I didn't re recognize during the this, this sessions. And so I let it go to voicemail. And I got, went back to my room between sw sessions. Swim meets have a morning session and an evening session. Um, if you want to learn about swim meets, just call me. Uh, uh, and I returned a voice. I listened to the voicemail and said, this is somebody from Michael. Michael Gerber wants to speak with you about co-authoring a book with him. And it was like, yeah, sure. There's a great line. And so um, I returned the call and they, you know, they started to talk to me about the opportunity. I said, where'd you get my name from? Where'd you get, where did this come from? They said, apparently I had just spoken at uh, Western Veterinary Conference. And I said, one of the books that every small business owner needs to have on their bookshelves is the E-Myth Revisited or the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It was a book that was very influential in my practice. And so the person in the audience had a hard time finding the original E-Myth because it had been out of print. I think the E-Myth Revisited was still in print. And they called Michael Gerber and said, uh, you know, we're looking for the, um, for the E-Myth. And they said, well, where'd you hear about it? They said, Dr. Peter Wangstein was expounding at it on the Western Veterinary Conference. And, you know, so they called and, and I said, I, I told the guy from the office, I said, I'm not talking business with you unless I get to talk to Michael because there are too many, too many scams out there. Now, Michael has a very distinctive voice and a very distinctive attitude. And um, so we set up a call and I, it was Michael's voice and it was Michael's attitude. And so we just had a conversation about what he was looking for. And I knew he was writing other verticals with other co-authors, chiropractor and optometrists and everything else. And so uh, the opportunity, because I truly believed in the message was easy. There was a template that we worked off of where he would write a chapter and I would write a chapter and the topics were, were there. And so I just took about six months using my weekends because I was, um, I don't even remember what I was doing at that point in time. I may have been with SCVMA, um, part of, probably part of it, and uh, wrote the chapters. We put it all together, and I think it's been out about five years now, but it was one of those phone calls that, you know, you just don't believe you're ever going to get, and it wasn't, I, I would like to say it was the uh, publisher's clearinghouse. You just won $50 million, and you can get a check for a dollar a week for the rest of your life. Um, and in many ways it was, because I would suggest that the book has been very, uh, has opened a lot of doors and a lot of speaking and writing opportunities, but yeah, it was one of those things that came out of the blue. It was not something that was on my radar screen in any way, shape or form. How very cool is that story? Yeah. But then again, there's a, there's a networking story. This is somebody who listened to you in class, reached out, the network looped back and there you are. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, if we if we sat and talked to a lot of our colleagues, we would find these very similar stories about just how this convoluted network came about and somebody gave somebody your name and here you are and here you are doing this thing. And you're like, wow, you know, that's kind of an incredible uh, path that it happened. Um, so, Peter, I, I, tell me what advice you would give somebody who's like and I know you do this for students a lot. Uh, they're facing a big life or career decision. What, what's your best advice? Other than reading? Well, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the simplest thing is to take a piece of paper and write down pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, and I use this line a lot frequently when I'm speaking or writing, uh, do you know the difference between a rut and a grave? And just the depth, right? <laughs> yeah, the depth and how long you're in it. Yeah. And yes. so way too many of us live in that rut and we just keep walking back and forth and it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really suggest that more people fail from failing to take the first step than from taking the wrong first step. Mm -hmm. And so if you think that it's time for a change, then it's time for a change. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if you've gotten to that point that, it's, that you're thinking about it, then it's time for a change. And it's scary. I mean, leaving SCVMA, even though mentally I had thought it was time, coronavirus uh, 18 months or so was really challenging for associations. It was challenging for me as a veterinarian with colleagues who were going through it, with, with staff members going through it, and to run an association. So, but we came through it really well. And I, I think the association did extremely well. And so I said, you know, now is a good time because I'm tired um, from, it was, I I'm a very empathic leader. And so I was tired and it was a good time to let somebody else take and run with the success. So change is, is all about being willing to accept pleasure and pain where the hope is greater on the pleasure side and the pain will be just from re the, the readjustments. I mean, it's like strange working from home and not going someplace. Mm -hmm. It's strange not getting 33,000 emails every day. There's a lot of benefits to it as well. So my, my suggestion is if you're fig if you're even considering a big life or career change, then it's probably a good time to make that change because otherwise it's gonna be in the back of your head. Why didn't I do it? Shouldn't I have done it? And then you just wait and you wait and you wait and you live in Groundhog's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, better to try than live in regret your whole life, right? I, I've, I've said to so many young people, this is the only one you get. You know, this is it. This is your life. Enjoy it and do things that you love, do things that you enjoy. And, and not to say that you're going to enjoy every single moment of every single day, but there are things that you find joy in when you, when you do your work, when you encounter other people, when you, you know, you got to celebrate the wins. That's the other thing too, is we're, we're spending a great deal of time in veterinary medicine, bemoaning our fate and the negativity that there's there, but we're not talking enough about how wonderful it is. You know, I've been doing this since 1985 and have I dealt with bitchy clients and difficult doctors and been in practices that I wouldn't take my animal in for a million bucks? Oh, yeah. But for the most part, looking back on all that, I have been extremely happy. My husband says, God, I wish I had a job that I loved as much as you love what you do. And I, that's what I wish for everybody, that they just love it that much, because it's not perfect, but nothing is and nowhere is. But the job that we have is to make it better instead of just bitching about it. Work on it. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, it's, it, you can either be a leader or a follower. Mm -hmm. And I, I think leaders take that first step and they encourage the followers to follow through with them. I, I think in making decisions, I used to call my dad. Mm -hmm and uh, don't have that option any longer. So I have to look at myself in the mirror and I say, okay, you know, it's like good cop, bad cop. Um, but I, I think we go back to the network concept, surround yourself with a, a success team. Those people who you can call, email, text, send an owl, whatever you wanna do um, at any time with a question and you know, they'll be straightforward with you. And listen, shut up and listen. Yeah, that's, and, and that's, that is so true. Like, don't ask for advice that you don't take. You know, that's the other, the frustration that we have as consultants is people will ask us and pay us and then not do what we say. And, I, but surrounding yourself with people who will give you honest feedback it, it, it is so true. And, and that you count on to give you good advice. Um, what is that? Hey, Debbie, the, the, the frustration we have as veterinarians is we have clients who pay us a lot of money to get great ideas and don't treat their pets with the antibiotics we send home. So consultants get frustrated with veterinarians, veterinarians get frustrated with their clients. You know, it's, it's just a circuitous path. It is, it is. And, and we all can do better with showing people like how to be successful in, in these things um, rather than dictating down from this authority top, let me teach you how to fish, right? Let's teach a man how to fish and how to think about things. And, and I think that's the same thing with the clients. It's all about how we listen to our clients and how to help them be successful treating the animals rather than saying, you need to do this. Let's say, how can you do this? How can I help you figure out how to do this? 
and, and you know, for me, I, I spend a great deal of my career teaching animal people how to successfully talk to humans. <laughs> so that's, this is all about what it is. So Peter, tell us a fun fact about you. Do you have a secret talent, a favorite song, something people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, I sing in the shower. No, <laughs> I, I, I like to play air guitar while I'm driving. Okay. You know, I, 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 uh, I don't have a secret talent and I have a favorite artist. I mean, I'm a, a Bruce Springsteen nut since the 70s. I don't think that would surprise anybody. And I don't tell a lot of people, but I do have a famous uncle who won the Nobel Prize in medicine. So uh, there is a little bit of a gene pool that uh, passed down from, from generation to generation. But I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an, I'm, I think like many of my colleagues, I'm a, uh, I'm an extrovert when I have to be, but I'm an introvert because that's what I want to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I tell people when I grew up, I was painfully shy and they look at me and go, you've got to be kidding. I went, no, really. And I'm very happy immersed in a book or sitting in my office quietly. And then, but I do love people and people fascinate me because to me, they're a fascinating story. And it's like reading a really great book. Um, you know, people's lives are, are pretty awesome. Um, so Peter, thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it. I knew it would be a great conversation. Any final words of wisdom you want to share? Anything you'd like that, that we missed that you want to tell about yourself or your company? And I, I often ask about a favorite book, but obviously e is one, but do you have another one that you think should be, uh, you know, on that bedside table? One of the books that was, most influential for me and in many cases liberating just based upon the uh, the content in it and was uh, Jack Canfield's The Success Principles. And I was able to bring Jack to speak to the uh, that partners group a number of years ago. And the first principle in The Success Principles is take 100% responsibility for your actions. And I think that we make mistakes we look to blame other people when things don't work out. I remember my kids saying, it's not fair. It's so unfair. And it's like, that's not what it's all about. It's about the decisions you make, the actions that you make are yours. And so go with them. And if you make a mistake, own up to it. And if you're successful, it's your choice. So take 100% responsibility for your actions. Read Jack Canfield's The Success Principles. That's probably been the most influential book in, in many ways over my last 20 years or so. But if I were to unblur the background, uh, it would look just like Debbie's house with lots of bookshelves and lots of books. Uh, leaders are readers. Leaders are listeners. And I think that uh, if I were to suggest to anybody do what you can, learn what you can to become a better leader of your own life so you can be a better leader of the lives of other people. Awesome final words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I have another book to read and add to my show. I've, I've fortunately moved on to Nook <laughs> because and, and Kindle. I have one of each. Uh, when I found out you could put 2,500 books on one, I was sold. Absolutely. But I still love a paper book and highlighting and turning pages and you know, making notes, um, yeah, read to learn, read to study, read, and then read it again. You know, just a, book, a great book is meant to be read multiple times because you're going to learn something new every single time. Well, Peter, thank you again so much for being a guest. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in January when we, uh, hopefully you're going to come to the Vet Partners meeting and uh, I'll be there for the whole time and for VMX too. And as I said, um, since you're part of board resources and I'm going to be the new president, I will be asking you, what am I supposed to be doing in this job? Debbie, thanks so much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And I, I look forward to seeing you in three dimensions in the next couple of weeks as well. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.